Good afternoon, and welcome to our May edition of Lunch with the Libraries. We are happy that so many people are joining us today to hear from Joseph Plaster, Curator in Public Humanities and Director of the Winston Tabb Special Collections Research Center at Johns Hopkins University. Joseph will present his public humanities projects and research that animate his recent book, Kids on the Street, Queer Kinship and Religion in San Francisco's Tenderloin. I'm Erin Joukowsky, Senior Associate Director of Lifelong Learning with the Office of Alumni Relations. This series is made possible through partnerships with the Sheridan Libraries and University Museums and the Friends of Johns Hopkins University Libraries. Following the presentation, I encourage you to ask Joseph questions in the Zoom Q&A. We will do our best to respond to as many questions as we can in the time that is available. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Claire Miller, President of Friends of the Libraries. Claire? On behalf of the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries, I'm delighted to welcome you to this month's Lunch with the Libraries, our ongoing speaker series that spotlights the unique collections, pioneering initiatives, and outstanding staff of the Sheridan Libraries. We are very grateful for the partnership of our co-sponsors, the Johns Hopkins Office of Alumni Relations Lifelong Learning for their support in making the lunch of the libraries possible. Founded in 1931, the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries is one of the oldest university library support groups in the United States. We provide financial support and advocacy for the Sheridan Libraries and organize events like this to bring members of the campus and the wider communities to the libraries. The Friends include people like you, alumni, faculty, staff, student, parents, and community members. I encourage you to join us if you're not already a friend to help ensure that the libraries remain one of the university's strongest assets, the heart of intellectual life at Hopkins. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Joseph Plaster. Joseph Plaster is the Curator in Public Humanities and the Director of the Winston Tabb Special Collections Research Center at Johns Hopkins University. His research and teaching combine archival, oral history, and public humanities methods to examine the world-making practices of marginalized publics in the United States with a focus on intersections of gender, gender sexuality, and race. <clears throat> Plaster was awarded the National Council on Public History's Outstanding Project Award in, 1920, in 2023 for the Peabody Ballroom scene. He was awarded the American Historical Association's Alan Berube's Prize for Polk Street lives in transition, a project that drew on oral histories to intervene in debates about gentrification, policing, queer politics, and public safety in the polarized setting of, of gentrifying San Francisco. His writing has appeared in Radical History Review, The Public Historian, the Abusable Past, CALFO, a journal of comparative and relational ethnic studies, and GLQ, a journal for lesbian and gay studies. He completed his PhD in American studies at Yale University with a certificate in women's gender and sexuality studies. Joseph, thank you so much for being with us today and for all that you do. With that, I turn it over to you. Uh, thanks to the Friends of the Libraries for inviting me and for hosting this, this wonderful series. Uh, I see some familiar names in the attendees section. Sam, Mike, Margaret, Mac, Don. Uh, thanks for, for showing up and 
and uh, listening to my, my chat about this book. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? I get a thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the journey of writing Kids on the Street uh, and involved about five years of engaged public humanities uh, research in San Francisco's Tenderloin, uh, during which time I conducted more than 70 oral histories, uh, another few years of archival research in San Francisco and around the country, and the process of writing it all up, which I really completed during the uh, early months of the COVID pandemic lockdown, when all of my public programs were canceled and I had a little bit of time to devote to finishing this project, which uh, started as a, a dissertation. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of context. Um, Tenderloin is a generic name for downtown vice districts. They were lodging house districts where marginally housed youth regularly lived during uh, beginning in the late 1800s. These were at once zones of abandonment and also havens for a wide array of marginalized people. My book focuses on San Francisco's Tenderloin from the 50s to the 2010s. And here you can see a photo of San Francisco's Tenderloin around 1962. And pay attention to the, the kind of peep shows, the sailors, bikers, and the hotels, which would have been characteristics of any Tenderloin district. And kids on the street, uh, this was a phrase that street kids themselves would have circulated in central city districts as early as the 1920s. Um, so kids were usually teenagers through their early 20s, but the term doesn't necessarily refer to chronological age. Um, a kid on the street could be virtually any age. The phrase instead refers to a person's role in the Tenderloin's intergenerational sexual economies and kinship networks. The kids are those, regardless of chronological age, who perform youth to stimulate desire and potential clients. And they're also those who are cared for materially and emotionally by queer mothers, fathers, aunts, and uncles. The kids were often known for their drug use, sexual experimentation, quote unquote, flaunting of gender conventions and frequent migration. So a psychologist in 1957 wrote that street kids were quote, homosexuals and adolescent rebellion, which is a phrase I, I really love. Um, so it took me you know, quite a while to figure out what this book was about. And the primary conclusion I came to is twofold. Uh, number one, abandon and throw away young people in Tenderloin districts created a politics of reciprocity and mutual aid as early as the 1920s and well through uh, the present day. What does this mean? Um, it basically means if you watch my back, I'll watch yours. If you take care of me, I'll take care of you. Street kids develop conventions for collective housing, self-policing mechanisms, and networks for pooling resources. They did this not necessarily because they were heroic or altruistic, but because it was a necessity for mutual survival. They had to care for one another in order to survive. And so the second part of this argument is that street kids developed ways to instantiate this politics of reciprocity and pass it down over time through performance, broadly defined. So today I'm going to tell you about the use of kinship terms and the creation of street families. Um, I'm going to tell you about religious ritual um, that street kids developed through what I'm calling street churches. I'm going to tell you about wildly creative storytelling traditions. Um, so for example, Coy Ellison, who you see here, 
a runaway in San Francisco in San Francisco's Tenderloin who passed himself off for years as an illegal Irish immigrant on the street. And I'll tell you why that was significant and why it was part of this, this public culture. And then finally, I'll tell you about migratory circuits that connected far-flung tenderloin districts across the country and bound bodies to seasonal and festival rhythms. So street kids developed this politics of reciprocity before the homophile movement, before the gay liberation movement of the 1970s, before the modern trans movement. My hope is that this book um, can be a political uh, resource in the present day. And that's my hope that animated you know, the entire process of research and public humanities and uh, scholarship. So I started this project around 2007, quite a long time ago, just walking around uh, San Francisco as a young person trying to figure out what it meant to be queer. I was working little temp office jobs and organizing with political organizations, going to the clubs and exploring different neighborhoods. Um, I would walk around the Gay Castro district, which didn't necessarily call to me. I'd walk around the south of Market, um, but I felt called mostly by Polk Street and the Tenderloin. Um, and I found that it had a rich history. So this map that you're seeing right now is from the late 60s. Each dot that you see uh, represents a gay bar or a queer institution of some kind. Uh, you can see Polk Street, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, near Van Ness. Uh, it was a kind of center of visible queer life before the 1970s and the cradle of uh, the kind of early queer and trans movement in the city. By 2007, when I was spending time there, it was still a haven for immigrants and working class queer people. Um, I started hanging out in the bars. I volunteered with street ministers. Uh, my friend Shannon and I danced at Divas, uh, a queer uh, trans club. And it, you know, all of those things really helped me imagine different ways of being queer in the city. Um, but this was also during the early dot com boom and during a time of wide scale gentrification of the city. So new businesses, neighborhood associations forced a lot of the queer establishments out of Polk Street and to a lesser extent, the Tenderloin District. Um, they cracked down on the homeless and marginally housed youth. Uh, they closed down establishments they deemed dangerous. Um, this led to a number of protests at the time. Uh, drag queens held protest marches, a group called Gay Shame held protests, and one of the themes I saw in these protests was that redevelopment can erase a community's history. So you see the sign at the top left that reads, don't erase our past. Um, so I remember feeling very emotional about it, that it was a kind of death of the queer scene that I started to identify with and wanted to become a part of. Um, and so I felt a kind of moral obligation to document this history that was in danger of being swept away. Um, but I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't exploitative or wholly self-interested. So the first project I developed in order to do this, and which ultimately fed into the production of this book, uh, was called Polk Street, Lives in Transition. Uh, so I recorded more than 70 oral histories um, with people experiencing changes on the street. And my goal was to use those stories to intervene in debates around gentrification and the criminalization of homeless populations on the street. I partnered with the GLBT Historical Society. I conducted interviews in apartment buildings, in the bars, in the churches. Um, and I edited many of those interviews into three to five minute audio portraits of the people I was meeting. And one of the things I started doing was playing these stories at 
the meetings of the business associations that were blamed for the gentrification of the street. And my goal was to challenge their claims to be promoting safety and family on the street by circulating alternative understandings of both concepts, alternatives drawn from the oral histories I had conducted. So I'm going to give you an, one example, um, and that's the example of Divas, uh, which was a full-time transgender club um, in the Tenderloin just off Polk Street. The new, the new uh, business association felt that it was a source of crime and prostitution in the neighborhood. They argued that it was an unsafe space, it was a danger to children and family, and they were actively working with the city and police in order to close the business. So I recorded... Um, several oral histories with Alexis Miranda, who was then manager of the club, um, identified as a female impersonator and did a lot of drag performance at Divas and in other locations in the city. And I edited together an audio portrait that offered a, a wildly different interpretation of the space. And I'm gonna go ahead and play her short audio portrait um, and you might listen closely to the story she is telling um, about divas, especially the story she's telling about family and safety. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and play that right now. If you like sad, I know you'll like it. If you like sweet. Most people that come to San Francisco, particularly in Fox Street, don't have a bond with their family, which is why they create their own. And you, you create your role models. They later become your parents or your family, I would say. That's the common ground there. That, you know, you're ostracized in your own family, so you come to San Francisco to be yourself. That's exactly how my story came to be. In Florida, I came into the drag community when I went to my first gay nightclub, and I was mesmerized by that. And I said, oh, I can do that. But in the, in the straight world or in the Latino world, Cuban specifically, uh, my lifestyle may not exactly be welcome. I heard that it was the gay capital, so I, I hopped the bus, and seven days later, I was in San Francisco. I got a job at Denny's and then moved on to Sizzler. And on Polk Street, while I was working in the daytime, I went out at night, and I was just carousing the shows and everything. And I met this person called Lola. Lola was my drag mother here in the city. He taught me how to embellish dresses and put rhinestones on them. And we, I made jewelry at that time because I couldn't afford any jewelry. So I made all of my jewelry with him. And he mentored me into emceeing and how to deal with people and how to deal with audiences. So I was doing the shows for 20 bucks a week and I was loving it. If Lola was still alive, then I would still be her daughter. Like my so-called grandmother, who was Lola's mother, is still alive. So I call her my grandmother. She taught Lola, Lola taught me. The first daughter I took on that I actually consider my daughter was 10 years ago. His name was Jason, and he was on drugs. At that time, she wanted to be a tranny, but her boyfriend was beating her up, and she was on the street, and she needed somewhere to go. So she came to my house, and we went through a lot of traumas and stuff. And if I, did, if I wasn't there, he would have died long ago because somebody, somebody was there to pick him up when he fell, every time he fell. Oak Street will make or break you. I mean, I've seen a lot of people die on Polk Street. If you have an addiction problem, it could be the worst place for you. It made me a stronger person because it made me feel that I was worth something, that I was able to do something to help in my community. You know, when I was a kid, I was told that I wasn't going to amount to anything. I was an abused child. And when you're young, they drain that into you and they push it into you. And then, you, you know, you come here and there's open arms without judgment. Some of the girls that I call my daughters are prostitutes. But I don't live their life for them. I just try to be there for them when they need me. Because one of the best things that I did moving to San Francisco is to live my life the way I wanted to, which means, you know, I, I make a living in a dress and a lot of people like it that way. And so do I. I've been the manager of Divas now for about six years. If Divas was closed, transgender girls would have nowhere to go. So that's my stake in, on Polk Street and at Divas is to make sure that there's a place for the girls to come to and the people who admire them and respect them because that's what makes Polk Street what it is. It's unique. 
it's family oriented, whether you like each other or not, it's family oriented because I know the hooker on the street. I know the drug dealer on the street. I know the, the bar owner on the street. Everybody knows everybody. So to lose that would be, you know, it would be a shame. Right. So this story um, required business association members to reassess the meaning of divas. Um, in this example, uh, divas is a safe space for trans women. Um, it's a space in which non-biological kinship networks are developed and sustained over time. And it's a space in which um, marginalized people can survive and receive uh, mentorship. So I talked with quite a few of the, the, the business association members and they remarked on how hearing these stories really changed the way that they viewed not only divas, but uh, the, the neighborhood itself. So let's see if I can move forward. Right, okay, so I also partnered with a professional photographer to uh, take photos of narrators. Um, I use the audio portraits. Here's some of the photos. Use some of the audio portraits to put together listening parties where people from warring factions were forced to come sit down, close their mouths, and simply listen to one another. Um, I used all of this material to create a traveling exhibition that paired oral histories and photos. Um, the narrators loved posing with their, their photos. Uh, and then this, this was also an opportunity uh, for dialogue among these, these warring factions and an opportunity to get to know one another a little bit more. And then finally, I used audio portraits to create uh, two radio documentaries that vastly expanded our audience. Uh, so the project enabled people to assert their identities and insist on the existence of a collective history. It fostered dialogue among groups competing for urban space, and it forced developers to acknowledge the history of the people they were displacing. And I think it had an impact. Divas remained open until just recently uh, during the pandemic uh, lockdown when it finally closed. Uh, the next project I'll try to briefly talk about is Vanguard Revisited. Um, so I launched this project with a pastor named Megan Rohr after San Francisco voters passed a sit-lie ordinance in 2010 that criminalized sitting and lying on city sidewalks. So there was a kind of vast demonization of street youth in particular at a moment when the city was uh, redeveloping. Um, so here you can see the, the sit-lie people um, protesting the sit-lie ordinance. Um, at the same time, I was exploring the archive of, of the GLBT Historical Society and here you can see some scenes from that, that archive. Uh, and I found in the archive this incredible um, zine called Vanguard Magazine that was created by street youth activists in 1966 and 1967. Um, and reading through these magazines and other archival materials, uh, I realized that young people were organizing against similar efforts to criminalize homelessness in the 1960s. Um, so this action, for example, was a theatrical street sweep that protested police sweeps in the Tenderloin District. And you can see signs they're wearing that read, all trash is before the brooms. So I wanted to introduce this history of Vanguard to contemporary street youth, but instead of simply delivering historical material to contemporary youth, I wanted to enlist them in documenting and interpreting the past in relation to their own lives. Um, so I did this first by partnering with uh, the Reverend Megan Rohr and also Mia Too Much, who was the project's paid youth intern. Um, we recruited young people through a lot of social service organizations, 
they were primarily people of color and trans youth uh, ages 16 to 23. And over the course of about a year, they received stipends to lead this, this project. Um, we began by examining those issues of Vanguard magazine. Um, we got together as a group and I shared those magazines with them. And then we asked them to uh, produce their own writings or poetry or artwork in conversation with the original Vanguard magazine. Um, and we published all of that together as this new 60 page magazine called Vanguard magazine. And one of the, the participants named Gaudi, I think beautifully summarized the project goals uh, in this letter he wrote to the 1960s Vanguard youth. So he wrote, before I lived in the Tenderloin, I lived in a place where the rebel who speaks to you now was confined with no way to express so much of what I feel until I heard of Vanguard. I read your words and heard your voice in the depths of my soul. And now I wish to give you mine, to be part of what you started long ago, to see our hearts collide on paper. So I love that phrase, seeing our hearts collide on paper was really the, the whole purpose of this, uh, this new magazine to draw genealogical connections between themselves and young people in the 1960s. Um, but it was also, you know, really fun. So here are some images from our magazine release party, where you can see some of the participants proudly holding up uh, the magazine they had produced. Mm. And there were a lot of other components that I won't get into here, walking tours of the Tenderloin, uh, intergenerational conversations with activists from the 1960s. But the culmination of the project was a day of actions meant to demand housing and employment opportunities to put an end to sit lie. Um, and young people decided that what they wanted to do was reenact this street sweep action that they read about in Vanguard magazine. Um, many of them felt help, uh, I'm sorry, felt hurt that the Castro district um, had supported Sit Lai, and they decided on this culminating mar march that would start in the Tenderloin and end at the Castro. So they pushed large brooms down the streets chanting, we won't be swept off the streets and housing equals safety. And Mia Too Much, the project intern, explained the significance of the action at a rally after the sweep. And I'll let you read what Mia had to say about the action in this next slide. Right, so they brought this action back. They, they reenacted this action from the 1960s to say, we have an investment in this community. We're going to sweep the streets of trash, not of people. So these two projects nurtured all of these connections between past and present, between historical research and social activism. And that really shaped my approach, um, not only to the book, but also to the work that I'm currently doing um, at Hopkins with projects like the Peabody Ballroom Experience and other public humanities projects. Um, but I ended up structuring the book itself as a kind of dialogue between the archive and the street, between ethnographic methods and historical methods, rather than a strict ac account of change over time. And I think this approach enables us to see a number of, thing, uh, of things about the survival strategies that span the decades uh, among street kids in tenderloin districts across the country. So the first one being reciprocity and mutual aid. Um, so kids develop this, this politics of reciprocity 
which is really based on the simple idea that people should help those who have helped them. Uh, anthropologists argue that this norm of reciprocity is steeped in morality. By giving, receiving, and returning gifts, a bond is created be between people exchanging them. So starting in the late 19th century through the 2000s, kids pooled their funds to obtain cheap uh, uh, housing in rooming house districts. A queen in Seattle's Pioneer Square recalled housing up to a dozen kids at a time in the 1930s. And she recalled, it was like kids together, fellows, comrades. The gay kids looked out for each other. We had to, we had to protect ourselves. According to my informant, Michael Norton, who lived in San Francisco's Tenderloin in the 1960s, kids watched out for each other. If one had a place to live, then three or four or five others would be leaving there, living there. Each one would pitch in. None of us was hungry. And the kids also banded together to generate protection from physical violence. So Bertie Rivera, a Puerto Rican queen in Times Square, said in 1965 that she and other kids formed their own gang called the Commando Queens. Part of their code of ethics, she recalled, was that each member, quote, had to protect someone who was getting beat up, someone who was queer. So I also learned through all of this archival and oral history research uh, about migratory circuits. Um, kids develop forms of reciprocity through migration. So for example, Joel Roberts told me about running away from home in the 1960s and finding a street family in Times Square. A queen gave him a new street name, Blaze, and invited him into her SRO apartment where a dozen other kids were sleeping. The kids taught him how to hustle, pool resources, and share information about abusive police and clients. And then during the winter of 65, Joel told me that he caught a ride to San Francisco's Tenderloin and found many of the exact same people in this district. He said that seeing them on the street was, quote, like coming home. And so this slide, you can see there's an image from a study in 1983 that tried to map the migration patterns of hustlers, street youth, and street queens. Um, I found that changing seasons often, often dictated migratory routes, annual fairs, conventions, and national festivals uh, like Mardi Gras dictated movement, uh, the heat applied by police in any city stimulated movement, and you know these seasonal and festival rhythms bound bodies to cyclical patterns and help foster novel forms of solidarity. Uh, one of the other uh, survival strategies that I focus on in the book is the creation of street family. So kinship and family were and continue to be common frames through which street kids express these mutual obligations and form of reciprocity. So uh, Lala Yantes, who identified as genderqueer and hustled Polk Street in the 1990s, told me about these kids and these little families that we make up out here that just accept you for who you are and what you do. The kids looked out for each other. When one of us was sick, the other one made sure they had what they needed. When one of them went to jail, we made sure we kept up the room because we were always living in hotels. We just did what we had to do for each other, like a family, except there was none of the hangups that come along with a bloodline. Um, I'll play this very short clip from Yoga, Yo Yo, who talks about how street family operates on Polk Street. I think it's about a minute. I remember back when Polk Street men, it was like we watched after each other. We were a big family. Let me explain what I mean by family. You don't have to be blood to be related to somebody. Like, you know, somebody needed to get well, we helped out with that. 
a couple will go to the needle exchange, you know, make sure our blankets and gear was washed. You know, we can't all over the place on point. I was 17 when I got here. I'd heard about the Castro, you know, and I always knew that my bread wasn't buttered on the one major side that it's supposed to be buttered on, right? And I knew that I had sugar in my tanks and, you know, I wanted to be able to live to be myself. Even, you know, Castro wouldn't, would only accept you so much. It was only integrated so much. Polk Street was a more acceptable place for the hustlers that had nowhere to wash their clothes every day, okay? Couldn't cut their hair and wear the certain clothes. And then, you know, I actually enjoyed sex. For me, that was my way of venting. So in the interest of time, I'm going to cut uh, Yo-Yo off a bit, but... Uh, I'll just add that street family, you know, they weren't just economic needs that young people were fulfilling, but also emotional needs. Um, And these families can be migratory. They don't have to be based in settled domestic spaces. Uh, I also found that religion and Christianity in particular was a common frame through which street kids fostered forms of reciprocity. And this for me was maybe one of the more surprising um, aspects of the street scene that I discovered through research. So in the book, I write about these queer underground churches in Tenderloin districts that were active from the 40s to really the present day. Uh, The ministers I followed often denounced the respectable world as immoral and elevated the outsider to the realm of the sacred. They oversaw rituals, ordinations, faith healing ceremonies, communions, and christenings that united abandoned people as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I write a lot about uh, different figures in the book, and as just one example here, Um, I'll take up the Reverend Raymond Brochiers and his work with a street youth activist group called Vanguard that I mentioned previously in the 60s. Uh, So Brochiers was born in 1935 in the South. By the early 60s, he claimed that he had become a Church of God minister and led evangelical crusades. And he later recalled that he was, quote, as anti-homosexual as any clergyman in the 1950s and early 60s. This all changed in 1964, I found, when he was 29 years old, when he was arrested on charges of sexual relations with another male. He recalled in 1976 that his extended family disowned him when the news uh, got out. And in 65, he fled to San Francisco and took up residence in a single residency hotel in the Tenderloin. It was only there, uh, he later wrote, quote, that I would even admit that I was a homosexual. But Brochiers drew on scripture to reinvent himself as a righteous crusader for street kids in the Tenderloin, street kids who were often tarnished as criminal, immoral, and lowly. Sometimes we wonder, he wrote in 1968, why God in his infinite mercy reached down and saved us, for we are so unworthy. The Bible says God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So the more unworthy we feel, the more he can use us. The more lowly we are, the greater winners we are for God. So he ordained himself through uh, this organization called the Universal Life Church in 65, and he founded his own kind of queer church in the Tenderloin. Uh, where he organized a seminary and trained and ordained ministers. Here's brochures again, and I'm going to wrap up relatively soon. Um, But this is where brochure's story intersects with the story of Vanguard in ways that I, I found totally surprising at the time. So I conducted oral histories with three former Vanguard organizers and found that access to Christianity at a young age offered them resources for managing and reinterpreting the abuse they experienced at home and continued to experience on the streets of the Tenderloin. I don't have happy memories of my family, Joel Roberts told me, but when I was living it, I made it happy. I think that's part of why religion attracts me. 
because you get all of these religious stories of people turning something good out of something really bad. Catholicism was a story about a man who was persecuted, beaten, and crucified, and somehow ended up being the winner. So in early 67, after meeting brochures at a Vanguard organizational meeting, uh, Adrian Ravaru, uh, one of the Vanguard organizers, and his boyfriend, a 19-year-old organizer named Mark Miller, joined Brochier Seminary. And here's a photo of Adrian in clerical collar after being ordained into Brochier's church. Uh, Adrian told me that he walked the streets at night with Brochier's and provided the kids referrals to social service organizations. Brochier's, he told me, carried a wallet that was extremely thick with references. You need a place to stay, he'll look through his wallet, find a place and get a home for a person that night. You don't have any money, he'll reach into his wallet. If someone didn't have any food, he would then look through his big pocket and find different numbers. I found that Vanguard organizer Keith St. Clair also enrolled in Brochure's seminary uh, around 1967, and I found this incredible application for ministry um, in the archives. You know, so all of these activist ministers oversaw marriages, engaged in faith healing rituals, and found emergency housing for kids on the street. And there are many other figures, religious figures, that I um, describe uh, in the book itself. Uh, but my argument and I'll probably stop here with street churches because I think we've run out of time, is that street churches were and remain essential sources of housing, food, and other material resources for abandoned youth in the central city. As such, they're part of the accumulation of obligations and reciprocities that comprise this street scene. But street churches also offered a powerful critique of the moral order that cast street kids as unclean, damaged, and deserving of abandonment. Drawing on scripture and ritual, queer ministers established the superior, superiority of the poor and lowly over the wealthy and powerful, and many drew on ritual and performance to fuel their path-breaking activism. Um, one of the other uh, kind of survival strategies that I focus on in the book is storytelling practices, and I'll, I'll skip that for now. Um, but I'll just say in conclusion, uh, the book really centers uh, the histories of street kids who were often tarnished as criminal and immoral. Um, and shows how they developed a flexible and fraternal accumulation of reciprocities by which they could have each other's back. Many insisted on the value of sociality untethered from the nuclear family, reproduction, and the gendered binary, and they dramatized their moral vision on the streets and boulevards in spectacular fashion. With that, I'll, I'll end, and I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions you all have. Wonderful. Um, and thank you, Dr. Plaster, for a fascinating presentation. I saw you having to sort of speed through at the end. There's so much here, so much to dig into. I hope we can find an opportunity at another time, uh, maybe for a part two would be wonderful. Um, but I will open it now to a Q&A portion of the program and encourage uh, anyone on the call to, uh, to use the Zoom Q&A at the bottom of the screen to ask Dr. Plaster a question. Um, we do have one already queued up from Sam. Sam writes that this is amazing research, and he would, would like to know what your process was initiating the oral histories. How did you choose those and build trust with the subjects? And did you face any obstacles or barriers? Yeah, I faced a, a lot of us obstacles. Um, you know, I can answer that question maybe just by focusing on the example of Alexis Miranda and divas. Uh, so I, I knew that I wanted to conduct oral histories with people who animated that space. And I would go and sit at the bar and just chat with Alexis. Um, and I, I remember 
the first time asking her if she would give an oral history and she declined and then proceeded to lecture me about all of the journalists who came into the tenderloin and then produce very sensationalistic uh, stories about the people she considered to be her family. Um, so what I did really was just, I kept coming back week after week and ordering drinks from her and sitting there and chatting with her and uh, establishing some rapport. But, you know, what really tipped the scale in my favor and what convinced her that uh, she wanted to record an oral history was when I started these um, dialogues between people who had been on the street for quite a while and the newer business and neighborhood associations that had begun policing the street and closing businesses. Uh, so I think I mentioned I started playing some of the audio portraits I recorded at the business association meetings, but I also worked with uh, a, a local conflict resolution organization to put together a series of public meetings between these warring factions where they talked about uh, the conflicts on, this, on the street and they began to uh, develop solutions. And um, so I think when I was able to present uh, a reason for Alexis to record her or oral history, uh, namely that this whole process could potentially save her business from closure. That's the moment when she decided, okay, I want to be part of this project. Like, I, I see that you are making an investment in the community. You've been here uh, for a significant period of time. I see that you are working behind the scenes to try to develop solutions. And now I understand that the story I have to tell can, contrib can, can potentially contribute to that process of um, bridge building in the neighborhood. So that that would be um, that would be my my answer to that question. Wonderful, and it was just absolutely wonderful to hear those stories as part of this presentation. So thank you. Um, pivoting just a little, you did talk about the Peabody Ballroom experience. Could you share how your work relates to the to the ballroom experience, a project that you launched at Hopkins? Sure. Yeah. So I, I launched the Peabody Ballroom Experience in late 2018 when I when I was just coming on board. And all of the methods I developed uh, through, you know, the, the Polk Street project, the Vanguard Revisited projects, um, really informed um, that project, which is all about trying to make a a kind of connection or develop conversations between the archives and the street. So the Peabody Project is a collaboration with uh, the ballroom scene, which is uh, a performance-based subculture composed primarily of queer and trans people of color um, with a history that you can trace back to the late 1800s. Um, and the idea is that we were bringing together Ballroom, which is a repository of knowledge and history, um, but, but it's a performance-based repository with the Peabody Library, which is also its own repository of history and knowledge, but it's primarily text-based knowledge. Right. And so one of the ways we bring those two repositories together is by staging uh, these epic annual um, ball competitions in the George Peabody Library, uh, where ballroom artists uh, base each of the competition categories in some way on a rare book from the library, from uh, a collection from special collections. 
an archival uh, collection from Johns Hopkins University uh, so that they are very literally performing uh, our archival collections, performing the stories found in the books at the George Peabody Library. And in the process, they're really transforming the meaning of our collections and making them accessible and exciting to uh, a public culture that Hopkins, you know, probably usually does not reach. That's so exciting. And as we were talking about the ballroom experience earlier, you were sharing a filmmaker was there at the previous experience, and there may be an opportunity to sort of see it as a film in future. Yeah, right now a filmmaker is working on two films um, based on our last year's project, including the ball. And we will be screening it for public audiences sometime in the fall. So I'm very excited about that. I am too. That sounds so fascinating. Um, and so my final question would be, how can Hopkins undergraduates connect with the LGBT, LGBTQ materials in the special collections through your teaching and research? Sure. Um, well, I mean, just very briefly, I, I taught a course this past semester called Queer Performance, and um, it was an introduction to the intersections of performance studies, queer theory, and queer history, but it focused on ballroom um, as well as uh, street youth. So it focused on, you know, these two things, two public cultures that I've, I've been talking about. And, you know, we were able to look at issues of Vanguard magazine, which we have in special collections, in much the same way that um, young people examine Vanguard magazine through that earlier public humanities project. Um, we were able to you know, look at and examine articles from um, the Baltimore Afro-American about drag balls that took place in Baltimore in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, which is an amazing electronic resource that we have uh, through Hopkins. And then, you know, finally, after three weeks of students learning about the history of the ballroom scene in Baltimore and beyond, and actually, um, we had a, a guest speaker as well, um, Marco West, who is part of the ballroom scene, come in and give them a kind of first person account of what ballroom is. Uh, they then were some of the few non-ballroom invites to our last ball, which took place uh, April 15th. And they wrote up some beautiful final papers uh, based on their experiences there um, and based on their experiences of ballroom artists interpreting and reinterpreting our collections, which I've been very excited about. And with that, sorry, it sadly looks like we've run out of time. So I'd like to uh, thank you again, Joseph, for generously sharing your time today to discuss your research and your book. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining, uh, joining us today. And I encourage you all to purchase a copy of the book, and I'll provide a link in the chat. Um, a follow-up email will be shared with you that will include a recording of the program. And we hope to see our viewers at a future Lunch with the Libraries event. You can always find and register for upcoming programs at events.jhu.edu. So thank you again and have a wonderful weekend.